Well, hello, everybody. I've got a very special guest on this video podcast for We Love Cycling. Um, it is Nathan House. Now, Nathan House, as well as being a good friend of mine, he was a world tour professional on the road for the best part of 10 years. Well, he was for 10 years. He won the Tour of Britain in the past, back in 2012. He's medaled in the uh, the Road Race of Australia Championships. Uh, he's been fourth in Amstel Gold. He rode for Garmin for several years. He rode for Cofidis for the last couple of years of his professional career. And in 2022, he embarked on a brand new career as a gravel rider. And in this conversation, we look back on his first year of doing that, 2022, and we also look to the future. And he also gives us a few tips of why you perhaps should try gravel as well. Hope you enjoy it. So, Nathan Haas, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast, uh, on the, the video cast for We Love Cycling. Let's get my cards on the table. Um, it's not early in the morning, but it's mid-morning. It's mid-morning in Derbyshire. It's mid-morning in mainland Europe, where you are. Uh, Europe, of course, is your base. But this is take two, isn't it? Because I was recording well, a tiny screen, and you were really big, and I was really small. And now we've got the proper view. So can I just apologise for my ineptitude? <laughs> You're such a lad, I am that. <laughs> this is this take is, two. You this, take is, two. Th this is the thing is this is um, supposed to be um, um, my job, um, but there you go. So, so Nathan, um, you're in Europe. You're not very well, are you? You're a little bit under the weather. Uh, we've, it's, we've. I mean, your hair looks right. I mean, my hair looks like oh, thank it's been you. up long. You, you're, you're, you're looking good. Um, if I'd know, I'm just going to summarise the, the previous part of the of the chat that we've had, so you'd have to go over it again. You've had no caffeine for the best part of a week, which is incredible. I mean, that's a podcast on its own. Your experience of not having caffeine. I've just had a nice having beef with rolls, man. I've just had an oat milk flat white. But um, you've been gravelling for the last year after ten years at, at, at World Tour, um, and I know you're going to have to do this again for me. But so please apologise. But just sum up what year one has been like for you um, on, on the gravel scene. Some of the big takeaways for you, because um, you're smiling. And, and every time I've seen you this year, you've been smiling because clearly you're just having a lot of fun. Probably more fun than you've ever had on a bike. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to quote myself from about yes. five minutes ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, isn't it terrible that my short-term memory is so bad that I kind of forget what I said? Or, what's, or what's even worse is I don't pay enough attention to what I'm saying that I don't even remember. <laughs> uh, no, anyway, my first year on gravel has been awesome. Um, you know, I, I think I tried to say before I'm not trying to shit on the road because I still love it and I have a lot of fun riding the road. But I, I just have a lot more fun on gravel. And uh, the, the scene is very reminiscent to what I started in, which was that sort of club scene where it's as much as about socializing and meeting people um it's the very essence the very dna of gravel um is also to be at these events um, you know we can call them races but it's, it's not like a road race where it literally is a race and sometimes an absolute fight to stay in the race um, whereas in gravel you know if you have a bad day that's okay it's not actually a bad day because it's still somewhere beautiful you're in nature and you're just on these sweet trails. You're getting these feed zones where there's all kinds of tasty treats. You're meeting people in the same boat as you doing this cool shared experience. Then you get to the end and, you know, it doesn't feel like, oh, you know, it's a failure. And, you, and you're certainly not worried if I get to start the next day. And you don't care what a director has to say about you know, your, your day. It's your day. You make it yeah. up as you go. Sure. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there is this racing side to it, which is really surprisingly more full gas than I ever expected. I, I didn't think I was going to walk in and, and win everything. That's, that's for sure not the case. Um, but I'm also really surprised at the level. And, you know, there was sort of a, a point in the season where I realized I really had to kind of like up my game if I wanted to try to win some of these races, which I eventually did. But the, uh, the takeaway from gravel for me is that it's the first time in cycling that I've seen a group of people truly have this thing that we, we don't tend to talk that much in cycling. It's called balance. And they they tend to have pretty good balance, not just in staying on the bike, you know, rubber side down, but 
you know, the the story I was telling before was, you know, we went to Sweden, I was traveling with a Dutch friend um, and we caught up with some, some other friends from Belgium, uh, another friend from Australia, Nico Roach, his brother, and then we made this big gaggle of Spanish friends and we all went out to dinner. Um, actually, most nights we were there. Yeah. And you know, this all became like this big new group of friends and we all raced against each other full gas, absolutely full gas, you know, putting people into kind of, you know, Gravel's version of a gutter. I don't know what we'd call that, like a, a pothole or a, a ravine yeah. <laughs> off yeah. a cliff into a river. Uh, so, you know, the, the racing is the racing's full gas, but at the same time, it's, it's not the sort of like doggedness thing. You know, you don't get that, um, you know, the Koenig thing that happened last year where they, you know, took Tim Wellens out of the race by doing weird teamwork. It's like, you know, everything's very honest, everything's very fair, but it's still real yeah. racing. Right? Like yeah. it's, it really is full gusto. But then straight afterwards, you know, everyone's sort of hanging around the back boot of a car and someone's brought an esky and they've got, you know, cold Cokes for everyone. And then, you know, half of you ride back to the start village where you're all staying, a few people drive back. And then that night we all still met up for burgers and, it's, and, yeah, and it, a few drinks. It's just truly it, fun. Yeah, it seems from what you said, and and and, and people at Wheel of Cycle, we know that w we spoke back at the at Ruler Live um, as well. Um, you had Alex, well, Alex Howes there and Nico talking about your all of your respective gravel experiences. But the big, apart from the just the quality now, the, the depth and quality of the races. And bear in mind that some of these events that you do in race, as you just touched upon. If you don't, if you're not feeling good, you can still have a, a great experience doing one of these gravel events, can't you? It's different for the World Cups when it's far more competitive, but just for one of the big gravel events, you can ride to win, or you can just ride to ride and have an experience. But the big takeaway for me from those conversations was was this balance. It's almost as if you've got the professionalization um, of the social side of it, and I, I, I want to want to say the word professionalization. It is getting more professional, but still it appears that at some of the events that have been around for a long time that have really got that integrity that are the uh, some of the first big gravel rides like there is it's that you're a professional who can basically go and have fun and get that you know you're you're riding at a high level you're clearly in exceptionally good shape but you're having the best fun and that's where the balance is isn't it because because quite often in, in pro racing let's be really honest these are conversations that are out there now you can be in your best shape physically, but not in a great shape mentally. And clearly gravel offers that up, doesn't it, as a proposition because of the social element and the fun that you can have at the same time. I mean, I'd argue that you can't be in your best shape physically. Yeah, no, no, okay. Yeah, 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 sure. Like they're not mutually exclusive. Like they they converge. And the closer yeah. you get to high performance, the closer they get. And, and I think what, what can happen and what we definitely see a lot in pro cycling is that they actually become divergent those two points and then it doesn't meet anywhere and then all of a sudden we're having these performance issues and everyone's having these questions so but but you know when we see like a rider who's winning early on they're super happy in road cycling and then unfortunately too much of your i, I guess self-assessed state of happiness um or you know perceived um you know rate of perceived happiness whatever scale we kind of put this on is often linked um, you know, to actually have someone who's going on the bike. You, you never see somebody immediately after an injury during their rehab. They're very rarely in like, you know, super positive sense of self, right? And that that can also slow down recovery. Yeah. Um, and then you also see people that have just, you know, some people take a long time to come fit. And some riders only do well in the heat. So all, all classics, you know, they're sitting here going like, oh, you know, I feel like I'm banging my head against the wall. And their performance either plateaus or it keeps going down because they're just not actually yeah. happy. Um, and, you know, I, I see this as actually the massive fault of pro cycling is that um, essentially we need a Ted Lasso in cycling, somebody that actually gets people, somebody that knows how to build a team, someone that knows how Great to build example. happiness into a situation. And um, there was an episode called the, he's, he called himself a rom communist because <laughs> he I, loved rom coms. I, I, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to season three of Ted Lasso. It's what a series. It's fantastic, isn't it? Oh, I mean, I it is. If none of you have actually, I suppose many of you listening, watching would have heard it. If you haven't, where, wherever you are in the world, please find it because it is, it's about soccer, but it's more about people and, and, and management and motivation. And um, it's, it's one of the strangest, funniest, most heartwarming 
dramas, comedies I've ever seen. It's fantastic, isn't it? I know we're going off on a bit of a tangent, but that's what you need. I mean, it is, it's such, it's such an allegorical tale as well, isn't it? I mean, it's so true, although it's a, although it's a work of fiction and finding that balance is what we're, is what we're all seeking in life. And clearly, Nathan, you're, apart from being a bit poorly now, you're in a, you're in a happy place. You do seem to be lot, having a lot of fun. And actually just, just on that point, when you, you talked earlier on about a strategies, you know, managers, you're your own man, aren't you, in, in, in an event like this? Just talk a little bit. I mean, you're supported by Conargo. You know, you've got a beautiful Conargo a fleet of gravel bikes, wonderful kit. I mean, check and, out and road bike. Yeah. The only thing and I'm road bike as well. With, the only thing I'm a bit sad about with my road bike is it became, you know, one year old yesterday when they launched the new V4RS. So, you know, I'm, course, I'm not yeah. current anymore. So maybe I've got to have a chat with my <laughs> but, but what is it like being, um, I mean, it's you're supported, but there is just by the very nature of what gravel is, there's no team cars following you by, you know, that they you, you pretty much just talk about the, Actually, because I don't really know. What about the kit and what about the support on a on a big gravel event? You know, you're going there with the aim to win, let's say. But what have you? Who's behind you? And and how, how self supported are you? So, so, what key component bits do you take on the ride? And what should you expect? There's a few. There's a few questions in there. So I'll try, I'll do my best to try <laughs> to break it down. Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't say you're alone because you have your partners to begin with, right? Um, and, you know, there's a huge network of people around the world that work with and for these companies that, you know, in a pinch, I can I can probably find some Camp Agnolo parts on most continents. Um, I can probably get, you know, a set of gloves sent to me last minute, you know, to, at a hotel sure. if I forget something. But um, what, what I don't have anymore is actually, the thing I'm, I actually struggle with the most is, Post logistics, once you've actually finally gotten to the place that you're trying to get to, um, which, which is more of a challenge than you think sometimes, because you know even if you've got a plane somewhere and then a train, and the train says, well, actually, uh, you know, in this country where you don't speak the language and even the leather system is different to yours, you didn't read that you had to pre-book your bike. And you're like, well, what do I do? And then you, there's some yeah. negotiation that goes on, and you finally get to the end of the train line, and then on the other end. You're trying to get into a taxi which doesn't exist and an Uber's not there and you still have 4Ks to go. So you just decide that I'm going to walk with a bike bag with 4Ks to my hotel room because this was this was hard. It said online that there's always taxis at the other end of this train station and there weren't and there's no one call and it's late at night. And then when you get in, the hardest point that I always come to is actually what are you having for dinner? Like, where is your closest restaurant? And, wow. you know, it's like... Gone are the days where I used to get down to dinner, you know, when it said eight o'clock, you know, at a race. Like, dinner will be served at eight. You get down, like, eight, ten. Dinner's still not on the table. This is <laughs> not acceptable. <laughs> Should I accept it, bar? And now I'm sort of like, all right, cool. Well, I've got my strategic, like, muesli bars in my bag. You know, I, I always bring, like, a, you know, basically, like, a snack pack. Like, I'm going on, like, a hike that I don't know how long it's going to go for, just in case I kind of get into that kind of pinch. So it's like, you know, you're high performance, but you're also managing some stuff, which is kind of just like life, right? It's, yeah. it's almost like it's almost like being a backpacker that's trying to win a bike race. That's a great, um, great description. But I, I would say that's like the the harder scale of things. Um, I would say the gravel gravelers, gravelistas, um, or the gravel cowboys, maybe is what we're calling the guys in America. They've they've got their setups a lot more dialed than anyone in Europe has at this point. Um, mainly there's more money there um, to begin with. You know, what some of the riders are getting paid to ride gravel bikes to bike. Man, like, th that's absolutely bananas, you know. Like, there's, there's a lot of world tour riders that dream of that kind of salary. And yeah. they're, buying themselves, they're buying themselves trucks and camper vans and all kinds of setups, and they're just driving to races, which when you've got one continent, even though it's a big continent, you can actually plan that out. And, you know, they're staying in the back of their camper, so they're not spending money on hotels, um, Whilst they complain about the price of gas in America, it's still yeah. the cheapest chips on anything that we've ever paid for per gallon. Um, yeah, they, they're paying like per gallon what we pay per liter. So, um, so their, their, their travel is still pretty cheap. Right. Um, but th their setups are fantastic. You know, they've got little um, stovetops inside their, 
their campers or trucks or vans. Um, they've got a shower. And then a lot of the time they still will get a hotel, but um, their logistics are pretty good. And, you know, a guy like Pete Stettner actually has his private mechanic that travels to races. And a lot of the time he will drive the van to the race and people fly. So he gets picked up on the other end. So Pete's had a nice right, okay. day. And, um, you know, that's kind of like the gold standard for gravel. Um, right. Whereas a lot of us in Europe here where I, we forget how small Europe is, but also how big it is. You know, I'm, I'm not going to drive to Denmark no. for a race or to Sweden because I'm also going to be spending a few nights on ferries and there's a lot of days away from home. Um, so logistically, it's it really depends. And, and it, it comes down to planning and price-wise, it comes down to pre-planning, just knowing which races you're going to do as early as possible, which was super hard this year because the UCI put out the calendar like mid-April um, before we actually knew what our calendar was. And then right. by the time we put things, you know, flights and costs for flights, especially this year with different um, you know, economic pressures made it pretty expensive to travel around. But um, it doesn't have to cost much and you can plan things really well. And that's been one of the things that I've learned this year is most of all is to actually appreciate how good I had it for 10 years because all yeah. those small things that went wrong, turns out they were really small things. Yes. So so, at, so what's the big, so when you're looking ahead, because you're still with Conaga for 2023, um, looking forward to seeing, are you, are you changing your kit? Because the kit you had this year, mate, it was really nice, wasn't it? I mean, you're, your, your kit was super smart. Are you changing that or are you, are you going to keep with that? Because it's pretty standout. Well, thanks for saying that. Um, no, it looks great. It looks great. But we had five kits this year. And that was sort of the crazy thing that we did was we changed the kit five times. Um, we tried to keep some brand identity through it. Um, but that's obviously pretty hard when you change the color scheme completely. Um, we are definitely changing the kit next year, but we're also trying to keep some continuity um, so we're, we're at an interesting point right now where we're actually just designing the kind of visual identity of the kit. Oh, right. I'm learning okay. all these, I'm, I'm learning all these very interesting terminologies and Brilliant. pretending like I know what they mean. Um, but it, it's actually a really fun thing for me, I guess, getting into this like design world, um, and actually thinking strategically and, and about when we can do launches, when things are going to look cool, when we're going to get attention on something. So it's. It's it's a whole different world that I've thrown myself into, and I'm absolutely loving every second. Yeah, of it. It you seem to me be. A lot of oh yeah, I mean you, you've got. I mean the, the racing's getting better and better, and there's more and more people taking an interest in it. It's obviously got it's got some interest, as we know from from the UCI that there's the World Championships. But it seems as if, from a personal perspective, rather than just focusing on riding, you're doing a lot of other things as well. So that the whole package of gravel riding isn't just getting on a gravel bike and racing. It's what you've just talked about. It's getting involved in the marketing side. It's sorting out all your own logistics, et cetera. So it's properly full time by the sounds of it. Although there's actually less, it seems that there's less days racing. You're spending a lot more time organizing yourself. And, and that must be quite, a, it must be quite an interesting year getting that all dialed. So I suppose there's going to be a lot of takeaways from this year that your learnings that you're going to take into 2023 because it's a it's as you've described quite eloquently and in a lot of detail it's very very different isn't it yeah you know i got to the end of october and i was absolutely exhausted <laughs> yeah i was like after, after worlds i was like man if i don't have an off season i think my legs just gonna fall off and it's so funny because you know total hours on the bike um was less than a world to a year which is not unexpected um, race days was like a fraction of a world tour a year. But the, the thing that really, really strangled me last year was how many jet lags I had. You know, I, right. America four times, um, Australia once, and every single time it was back to Europe. So, you know, if you consider that many times changing time zone, um, and then all of the travel days just to get to a one day race and the whole kind of, uh, hoo-ha that goes around getting to yeah. a race finding your feet finding the location of where the start is finding dinner sorting out how you're going to do breakfast all this sort of planning stuff it's it taxes you in a way that's um, just very different yeah not bad it's not a bad kind of taxing it's just a different time kind of tired um but that also was what this year was about for me it was learning 
um, and trying to actually refine the process for, for the year that we're about to go into. And my plan is completely different um, to what it was last year. The UCI still hasn't announced the full calendar, which is super frustrating. Um, and for what it's worth, they've actually lost a lot of the riders' interest um, that we're going to focus on the UCI calendar because a lot of the races you actually have to register for already now. And once you commit to a race, that's sort of like your calendar set. So if there's a yeah. conflict, you can't do a UCI race. Well, like you know, that sucks for them because yeah. you know, they're not getting they're not getting their events to be higher profile. But you know, they've had more than enough time now to actually sort this out. Um, it's just really frustrating because you know we try to communicate with them and they just give us almost nothing. Like they're, they're good people, they're great people, but it's just like it's very it's also very ungravel to be this disorganized. Like if you look at yeah. the organizations for gravel. You would not believe how on it these race organizers are. You know, I, yeah. getting emails from Steamboat saying, hey, Nathan, we haven't seen your name in the registration yet. Are you still thinking about coming across? And it's like, you know, That's what kind of isn't it? organizer can micromanage which pros are coming? You know, it's it's kind of insane, right? Um, and then for the UCI to drag their feet like this, and what's the biggest news I would actually say in gravel period over the last few years is now Europe actually has its own series. It's called the Gravel Earth series. It was just launched. Um, there's a company in Spain called Classmark, which runs so far the biggest gravel race in Europe. It's called the Tracker. Uh, they've now partnered with six other races um, across, well, actually not even just across Europe. They're even in Kenya. Um, they're in Iceland. And then the other ones are in mainland Europe. And it's an overall gravel series. And it's, wow. it's, um, it's an unsanctioned race, but I don't like the idea that we call UCI stuff sanctioned and the other unsanctioned because the organization of the class mark stuff is just like absolutely incredible. And the, the ethos behind the race, they're, um, they're essentially trying to be um, net zero carbon emission for the race. Oh, wow. They, That's fantastic. They, come, they actually come extremely close to achieving it already. Like they're, right. they're very cool people. Um, so my calendar now is basically based around this Gravel Earth series and then sort of sprinkling in a few UCI races in between going to America for the biggest ones in the States. Um, so where I thought UCI was um, in the right direction for building gravel here in Europe, um, I think they're just sort of going to be a little bit of a part of it going into the okay. future. Um, and, and I think that this new series is going to become the centerpiece of gravel in Europe. And and it's really funny. There's actually been so many races where I was like, oh, I could go over to the States for this one or I can stay in the States for longer and do this. But actually, I'd rather be back in Europe to do these yeah. races because these, yeah. these are going to be amazing. And then we've got guys like Terpstra coming across to gravel. We've got course, Nepal, yeah. we've got Valverde. Like the gravel scene in Europe is it's undoubtedly crazy, going to be the highest level in Europe. That's um, crazy. There's, there's going to be more depth still in the field in the, in the States. You know, there's, there's so many good riders in the States. But I think, uh, like we saw at the World Championship, I think there's just going to be this like, level above fitness um, and abilities when we when we come to a lot of these European races. So I think gravel is in, like, a super healthy place. Um, you know, there's obviously some fine-tuning that needs to be done. Um, and, you know, one of the only things that is a little bit hard to deal with sometimes is, like, that there's literally no prize money in Europe. Right. Um, and, and you can pay quite a lot of money to go to a race. Like, you know, Iceland Rift cost me around 3,000 euros to get to. Wow. It was 1,000 euros just to rent a car. But it's there's no next, price money. Right. A short interlude there. And, um, and Nathan, you were talking about the well, the expensive element of, 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 of traveling and doing gravel. You, obviously, you've got sponsorship, but you, you're, you're responsible for your own logistics and how efficient they are, I guess, as well, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. It's um, oh, hang on, let's. <laughs> this is take three. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. No. It's there's a there's a serious side to it as well, which is budgeting and working out what you're able to do in a season and what your priorities are, what the best sort of ROI is as well for your partners. You know, there's no point necessarily flying to a race. You know, in Colombia, if it gets no coverage as well, so. Um, the media in gravel is also a very important part of the sport. And um, in the States, that's really coming together. There's a lot of media. Um, there's uh, a group called Pure Gravel, which does a fantastic job in the States. And I'm sure that that's going to start 
growing here in Europe, a few more gravel specific sites and accounts and people sort of talk, talking about the races, but like, you know, ice and rift cost me 3000 euros to get there and wow. back, you know, just hiring a car for, you know, three days was I think 1200 because um, it's just super expensive there. And even going to the supermarket, you find out how much a bag of pasta is. You're like, Oh my God, <laughs> I could get okay. that. Like, I could be in Spain and actually have that cooked for me for the same amount, but it is still on the bag. Um, so it's it's interesting, but one of the, one of the things that's a little bit frustrating compared to where the US scene is, there's a lot of prize money in the states, um, and you know that doesn't necessarily matter for people who are just you know participating in these events. But when you're traveling all around the world trying to win them, that prize money really does actually help your overall budget or your profitability for a season, because um, you know it, it, in some ways as well, this is still a business for a lot of athletes. Yeah, you don't you don't um. You don't do it hoping to be in the negative for the season. You hope to be somewhat in the black. Um, but yeah, there's there's no prize money here in Europe yet. And you know, I won Iceland Rift, and I got this beautiful Icelandic wool jumper. But it also didn't help pay for my plane tickets. Um, yeah. So you know, the ja- the jacket's cool, but at the same time, it would have been nice to to have had some help to at least get there. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's so many moving component parts. To this, you know, as I say, you're looking, you know. You said a few minutes ago you're going to do 2023 very differently. What do you exactly? Can you just explain that a bit? That that's quite interesting. You've obviously a lot of learnings, but what are you going to do that's so radically different for 2023 than Nathan? Yeah, well, I, I spoke before about how the jet lag killed me, and there were a few races where I definitely underperformed because I was just still way too jet lagged. Um, and partially, what happened this season was that the UCI calendar was announced so late that I'd committed to all of these races in the States because you have to register them for, for them in November and December. And then once you're committed to a program and you've told your partners, your sponsors, you're doing this, certain things are in effect and you can't really change the flow of things. So I did a lot of back and forth thing, um, which was to detriment of my performance. It was still cool to be there and, and I still did well, but um, you know, you always look to do things better the next year. So uh, what I've done for this next year is I've, really sort of broken it up into blocks like you know, a big block in Europe to start the season a really big block in the states with you know consecutive races so I'm not just flying to America for one race and then coming home yeah I'm actually going to stay there for quite a big block and then another big block in Europe coming up towards world championships and then the option for another US block later in the year after that because the US race is almost through until the end of November um so really turning it just more into race blocks and then also having a little bit of a break period in the middle too, just to kind of reset physically um, so you can get back to training. Because when you're traveling, you actually don't get that much training done whilst you're getting fit through the races because they're, they're so long. You know, like Unbound is 321 kilometers. That's and crazy, isn't it? Like, yeah. Like that's crazy for Milan San Remo when you're in a bunch and you can actually kind of just like sit in and tap your pedals away from more than half of it. The difference is with gravel, like you're not doing less than 280 watts at any point during the day because it's fast and there's just so much friction in the tires that yeah, you get very little benefit from being in the peloton. You definitely get some and you want to be in the peloton, that's for sure, but it's it's just hard all day. So you get a lot of fitness from the racing, but you lose you lose a lot of days with the travel around it. So I've also built in, um, you know, purposely built in a, a rest and training period midway through the season again. So I can kind of have, you know, one up a dip and then an up sure. again and hopefully hopefully really kind of hit more targets this year. Um, you know, it's, it's not all about winning, that's for sure. But at the same time, you know, if you're doing it, you want to at least be at your best to give yourself a real chance to be at the pointy end of the race without stressing yourself too hard. Yeah. And and the World Championships next year, obviously it was in Italy this year, your top 20 there out of interest where are the worlds this end what do you know about the course well it's in the ne- same next place. year sorry yeah i'll say all right okay yeah and from what i believe happened um the citadella final which was so beautiful right now you're riding through this like medieval city it was it was not it was a really amazing place to actually host a race because they signed on so late um and it was really hard for them to actually you know, get, I mean, it would be hard for anyone within three months to get the funding to to put an event of that size on and also yeah. be the first 
before, the first gravel race to actually be televised, which comes at a huge cost, as you know, from being in this world. Yeah. Um, I think their condition was, well, we're not going to put all this money in and build this thing up um, and only get kind of like, you know, a small piece of the pie. We were on at least two years. So the UCI ah. granted them. Okay, I didn't know um, that. And, and, and rightly so, granted them a two-year um, hosting privilege um, for their commitment um, to the sport. So, you know, they, they did a really awesome thing for actually coming together more or less last minute um, and put this event on. The only thing that I hope for is that they managed to find um, better trails for us. It was it was weird. It was definitely a weird race. I still loved it. still loved every yeah. second of it. But it just was not anything like a normal gravel race. It was like a standalone event. It was like gravel bike path world championships where you're on road for more than 50% of it. And there was nowhere to pass guys. So, you know, when, when Italy and Belgium blocked the road and let two riders go up the road, it was just, it was literally race over. Like you couldn't, yeah. couldn't get through. And all the roadies that were there, like, you know, the, like the Italian team didn't even send Italy's best gravel racer to be in their team, Mattia De Marchi. They just sent road pros and they, they focused on having road professionals on the front line of the grid and, it just it didn't have the most gravelly vibe to it, and I think sure. that's that's not their fault either. Because you know, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? That's the UCI is not used to ho- hosting a gravel world championship, uh, or even kind of putting on these gravel world cups. So there's no um, there's no judgment from my my side. Um, I think there's just a lot of refining that they they ought to do. Sure. Um, if they want, if they want to keep the audience of people that actually love and follow kind of the real side of gravel, but at the same time, if it doesn't change, it doesn't really matter because it's it, it feels almost like a standalone event and a standalone yeah. type of event in the year. So even if it is the same, I'm still going to be there with as yeah. much motivation um, and hopefully even legs. And just finally, uh, Nathan, just to to wrap things up, anybody who's listened to this and is intrigued with gravel as a proposition. Um, I'm on my gravel bike a lot. Uh, I'm, I've moved to the Peak District, um, a neck of the woods you might know reasonably well from winning the Tour of Britain um, a decade ago. Um, there's lots of trails. There's lots of tracks. I just love riding it. It gives me – I ride it a lot on the road, especially in the winter. It's just easier. And also I can just make a call to just go off on a path that looks a bit gnarly if I want to. It just gives immense flexibility. But from you having done it for a year and also – having ridden on gravel a fair bit when you were a pro, there was that transition. It's, it's it's such an enjoyable thing to do as a break from the road and it still keeps you super fit. If anybody's watching this, listening to this, what sell it to them. You know, why if they haven't ridden gravel, tell them why they should. So anybody listening or watching this, Nathan, you've got you've got their attention. Why should they do a bit of gravel? It's a good question, Matt. It's a good question. And I, and I think different things tickle people's fancies in different ways. But I think most people's migration to gravel comes quite organically. You know, a friend says, hey, I have a spare gravel bike. Would you like to come and try it? And, yeah. and I think it's one of these things that you have to experience. You know, I, I, can, I can speak for hours as to why I love gravel. Um, and most of the time that resonates with people that already ride gravel. But um my, my only recommendation would be just to go try it. You know, I think life's all about trying new things, not getting stuck in a rut um, and always just thinking, you know, I, I like this meal at a restaurant. I will order this meal every single time when maybe, you know, something else on the menu is actually your favorite or, or just another another option. And, and, and I don't think gravel replaces road cycling. I still, <clears throat> excuse me, I still love riding road. Mountain biking is fantastic. Yeah. Track racing Track riding is fantastic. It's, I, I think as long as people are getting out on bikes, um, that's, yeah. that's I think, part of our key message. You and I both share that is that yeah. our life's journey is to help people discover and keep falling in love with bikes. And I think gravel is just another way to fall in love with cycling. So my recommendation is just, just to go try it. And you don't even need a gravel bike to start with. You can just put the fattest tires that your road bike can handle or even go mountain biking with some friends on a gravel bike. And just yep. see what the compression is all about. Because it, it is a different experience to mountain biking. And it's very obviously different to riding a road bike. Um, and, you know, a lot of people can say that, you know, it actually isn't its own thing. But once you do it, you realize it very much is its own thing. Yeah. And it has 
has its own essence and um, depends where you are in the world, how that essence actually is. You know, if you're in Peak District, it's, I mean, that's definitely one of the best places in the UK to ride a bike, period. Um, but, you know, I, I first started doing a lot of gravel when my partner lived in East London and I, I, I literally could not handle the stress of trying to get out anywhere to ride a bike. You know, if I had a three hour ride, I felt like I did an hour 10 to get to um, Epping Forest on the road. And then I had 40 minutes of rolling around, de-stressing, thinking about the fact that I have to ride home. And then <laughs> I, I bought a cyclocross bike to leave in London. And then I started going out on all of the canals, which is gravel riding, right? And the gravel yep. could take me out to Epping Forest in 35 minutes directly without touching a road. And then I could just do all these trails for hours and hours and hours. And I'd often be home super late because I was just having so much fun. And, and I think it, it's just another vehicle for people to ride more. Um, and I think definitely the safety issue is is a huge thing. I think the, the world was shocked yet again by David Revelin's death. Um, I certainly was. Like my first rides back out on the road afterwards, I just had this feeling where we're just so vulnerable. It's not it's not down to us being smart road users. And and don't get me wrong, don't don't go out and be a dickhead on the road either. Like yeah, follow yeah, the totally. rules. Follow yeah. the rules. We're just another part of the road. Um, uh, format when we're on the road you know we have to be considerate of others it's not just about saving our own ass but <clears throat> i definitely felt the stress and and instantly i i was drawn again to doing more training on my gravel bike just yeah. to stay away from that because you know if you crash on a gravel bike sure it's gonna hurt but you don't have a you know three-ton truck to to follow that up and crush you sure yeah drag you along the road so for anybody who has access to gravel, which I'd argue almost anyone does, even if you live in London, you have an incredible amount of gravel. You just have to go and discover it. Yeah. And the thing that I've been sort of most heartwarmed by in the gravel world is that there are so many forums, there are so many groups, like just type in whatever city you live in, gravel, <clears throat> and there's most likely going to be a gravel group in your area. And all you have to do is say, hi, guys, I'm new to gravel. And you're surprised how many people say, hey, we've got a ride going on Saturday. Come along. And you meet people. And and I think, um, you know, road riding can be a very solitary sport at times, whereas gravel is just so inclusive and it yeah. draws people in and it pulls people in. And it's it's very addictive in that sense. And I've, I've made so many friends this year um, of people that are, nowhere near looking to try to win a bike race being professional they just love riding bikes and yeah. <clears throat> i'm so i'm personally so drawn to that energy that um it's given me a lot of joy and pleasure this year just riding with people from all walks of life on a bike and i think that's that's what crowd was about it's it's keeping it simple but um to take it back a step again is just just go go try it yourself and see what it's like and, and i think you'll see that um it's probably going to be something you like yeah, Nathan, it's, been, it's a lovely way to end this conversation. It's uh, Thanks very much for being so generous with your time as ever. And best of luck in 2023, mate. Thanks again. No worries, Matt. Thanks for having me on the show. Cheers, mate.